Hello, we're Team 5040. I'm Isaac, and this is a lesson in CAD and it's used in FTC. We as a team use CAD each year to help us build and design our robots. CAD stands for Computer Aided Design and is a 3D modeling software that helps you design and assemble parts. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm going to talk about why we use CAD. Before I talk about my points, I want to point out the quote that is above me. CAD is not the magic genie that will guarantee you success in FTC. When used properly, it is a great tool to aid teams in building their robot. This quote is from Game Manual Zero, and I highly recommend looking into that website after this video if you want to learn more about what we're talking about today. It's important to point out that CAD is not the end-all tool for your team to succeed, because if you go into learning CAD like that, you will not progress as a team. You will not become better than you were before, and you will not excel as a team. You need to take into consideration uh, how your team can use CAD, the access to tools that you have, the tools you already are able to use, all of that, and many more put into this one bubble. That bubble will help your team progress and excel, but CAD alone will not do that. It's the same as saying a single hammer will make your team excel, right? That's not gonna happen. You need to be able to know how to use the hammer, but also know other tools that that hammer can be swapped out with, right? So my first point is uh, CAD can open doors for a future in STEM. If you're going into FTC, uh, you're probably thinking about a career in STEM in the future. Uh, and if you want a huge head start uh, when it comes to being a, a successful uh, member of the STEM community, or if it's a possible job opportunity for you, understanding basic CAD is incredibly important. Uh, you can see there's an example here. It is a fidget spinner uh, with uh, a drawing next to it, right? If you can do something very simple like that, like that is a pretty simple uh, model to make. If you can even do something like that and you wanna go into a career in STEM, you're already in a huge uh, step in the right direction. Uh, and it really sets you apart as being a leader in STEM as opposed to really not putting in the passion and understanding uh, what it is to be a professional in STEM. So it really, really helps you out there. Uh, for your team, it opens up doors to using 3D printers. So as you can see on the left here, there's a 3D printer. Uh, you can use CNC machines, laser cutting machines. You can run simulations, whether that be aerodynamic simu simulations, stress simulations. Uh, you can make 3D renders, highly realistic 3D renders of your robot, uh, and many more things. And that all opens up when you're able to understand CAD. My second point here is that CAD eliminates errors. So if you're able to design your entire robot digitally on CAD, right, you can look at that and you can say, we need this amount of screws at this length, we need this amount of parts, and you can put that all in, what we do is we put it in a spreadsheet, and you're able to look at that and say, the robot at this design costs this amount of money, and then you can, if you would like to, and I think this is really important for rookie teams to understand this, that you need to be very careful with how you spend your money. So if you're a rookie team and you're looking into getting into CAD, one of the huge things for you is that you can use CAD to save a ton of time and a ton of money, uh, and you can design around. So if, if something is a ton of money and costs an extreme amount, you can design around that and maybe you can bring it down to even 50% of the price it was or even more than that. Uh, and that can only really be done with CAD when you have a full catalog of what you have. CAD offers the ability to make your own Lego book. That's the example I like to use because you're able to look in and build from it and then you can see this is the dimension we need, this is the tolerance of these parts, this is how this part would operate in a real world scenario, things like that. And CAD really gives you the opportunity to do that. CAD also eliminates the amount of time it takes through the design process, which is incredibly important. Uh, the pacing of how you go about designing, building, competing, that's a very important schedule that you need to figure out as a team. And CAD helps out a lot by shaving off the time it takes to design. Point number three, CAD can be used to efficiently share ideas and concepts. So we use CAD uh, to convey our ideas better. Uh, one of the examples I wanna use is, let's say a flywheel mechanism. So I need to shoot something with two spinning wheels. Uh, in order to do that, uh, instead of drawing that on a whiteboard and trying to convey that idea to the team, I can just make a 3D model of that 
and the team can access that and they can look at all the individual parts, how everything lines up. Maybe someone catches that a screw is in the way and they point that out and that saves a headache, right? Eliminating errors. Um, but you can take into team consideration and team, um, maybe they have suggestions on how to improve it. It's a lot less time to improve a CAD model than it is to rebuild and tweak a physical prototype that you've built. So you can make your prototypes that you want to convey on CAD in a very short amount of time, and it makes the design process way easier, and it really puts you in a step in the uh, as being a next-level team. Uh, point number uh, four is that CAD opens pathways for custom parts. As I mentioned earlier, as a team, you once you understand CAD and you have a confidence in CAD, you'll be able to use 3D printed materials, CNC, laser cut, all of these amazing things that maybe you didn't have access to before. Uh, and these can be used to make parts and mechanisms more efficient, uh, lighter, stronger, really anything. Uh, 3D printed parts can really help out with that. Uh, so understanding the limitations of a 3D printer is important as well. Uh, you can't print your entire robot uh, maybe you could try, but I would not recommend it. Um, there are specific things that you can 3D print and that you could 3D print uh, for a competition robot. Uh, and it's important to understand what those are. And you'll learn that as you progress. Uh, CAD itself is a huge learning process. And so as you're going through learning more about CAD, using it to compete, you'll understand more of the limitations. You can also find a lot of resources online uh, that kind of outline the limitations of uh, 3D printed like materials and things like that. But for the most part, CAD itself, if you don't understand CAD and you want to 3D print, uh, you'll never be able to 3D print unless you can get someone else to do it for you. But once you understand CAD, you have that direct access to making any part you want, which is an incredible engineering tool. And my final point here. Uh, CAD can be used to sell a more professional tone. So it's really important to take into consideration, how does CAD help Notebook? How does CAD help our outreach, right? And you can use 3D renders or detailed part drawings. So you can see on the left of the fidget spinner, there's a, a drawing of the fidget spinner. You can include those and judges can look at those and have a better understanding of what you are designing, the thought process that went into designing it, what that part looks like on its own, how that part works with the rest of your robot. You can get animations and images and pictures of your robot that you probably could not get in the real world, and it really sells a professional tone. Uh, an example could be you could put it uh, for social media. You could share a render of your robot, and that really catches the eye of the community. Uh, and that's one of the small sort of avenues you can go down when it uh, when it comes to using CAD to be more professional. It really sets your team apart. So as you can see here above me, uh, and I think to my, I guess to my left here, uh, is our robot uh, Bagel Blaster. This is from our ultimate goal season. It's called Bagel Blaster because the rings look like bagels. Um, and I wanted to point this out because this is an example of after you get the confidence in your stride when it comes to CAD, this is the type of thing you can you can do. So when I mentioned Lego book instruction, this is our Lego book instruction. I can, if I wanted to zoom into each of the parts of the full robot and say, this is exactly where this screw goes. Or for the most part, I can say, um, you know, I can in, like take an individual mechanism. For example, we have our, our flywheel in that corner up there. Um, that flywheel is its own uh, model. And so I can look in even more detail at that and edit that and fix that. And then I can see how that plays into the rest of the robot. Um, so this is a really good example of that. I do wanna point out that I've included uh, over here the uh, version number. So it's version 31, which means we went through 31 different iterations of this robot before we reached the final product, which is what this is. Um, and so we're gonna do a magical little back in time transition like Miss Frizzle style. And we're gonna check out uh, version nine, which was back in January. So this is version nine. Uh, and it's important to point out that you can see the inspiration that led to the current version, but you can also see the progression that was made. So this alone itself is a very good model. Um, there are some issues with it and things like that. And that's why we made those iterations. And that's why we went through 31 different versions. I wanted to show this because 
this was an example of right when we started being confident in, in our CAD ability as a team. Uh, this was right when we, we were thinking to ourselves, let's construct the robot in CAD, right? We knew we were going to, but we never thought we'd be able to up until this point. A lot of us never CADded before. This was the one of the points where we were able to begin doing that. And so that I wanted to point that out because this is a fond sort of memory of when we sort of started taking our stride in CAD. Uh, we're also going to do a little, I'm going to pull up a picture here in a second of what the robot actually looked like at this time. So this is the model we were referencing from. And now I'm going to show you what the robot looked like. And as you can see, took a little bit of a diff, uh, different turn here. Um, it is funny to point out. It kind of makes me laugh sometimes. But um, part of the reason this happened and part of the reason uh, the intake looks way less developed than the rest of the robot is that uh, we did we designed our robot spending a ton of time making the flywheel, a ton of time making the skeleton and drivetrain, and then we realized at the end we didn't save any time to make an intake or a wobble goal mechanism, which is what we were using in that season. Um, so this is it's. I want to point this out because this is what's going to happen if you don't uh, allot your time correctly and if you don't really um, give time to design each part. Uh, and really, my only sort of tip for that is the more you design and the more experience you have, uh, the better you're gonna be when it comes to avoiding situations like this, like duct tape and cardboard. Um, it worked. I'll tell you that this robot worked. It's just not the most efficient that we could have gotten. And that's because although we had a pretty efficient CAD model, we spent too much time focusing on individual pieces to be able to have the finished product. So I just thought this was really important to point out um, because it also serves as an, as an example as why it's important to schedule yourself and make sure that you're uh, on task when it comes to what you're modeling. So I wanted to quickly point these out. Uh, these are called Pintos. These are our off-season demo bots that we worked on. Um, and I wanted to point these out because these are you know, very custom and they're kind of examples of the next step in uh, after you learn CAD and you're confident with CAD. Um, a lot of this is like most of the parts on these little robots are 3D printed um, or there's custom spacers and we were we designed all of this in CAD before ever thinking about buying. Uh, and one of the big things about this project, about this demo bot is we wanted to see how cheap could we make them because the cheaper it is, the more you can make. Um, at least for our team. And so we uh, were able to actually just have spreadsheets of different combinations of parts, different sizes, different designs. And out of all of those, we were able to find the cheapest and the most robust, uh, which would be you know the Pintos that you're seeing today. Um, and so I just wanted to point these out because these are a really good example of how your team can take the next step. So we did that through uh, partially through using our CAD skills Hello, my name is Cameron, and I'm going to be talking to you about where CAD is used. Firstly, CAD is widely used in FTC. It is used by us, 5040, as well as our sister team, 2464, as well as many other teams. But CAD is widely used in the real world as well. CAD is used in many industries, such as the automotive industry, the shipbuilding industry, and the aerospace industry. As you can see on the slide, we have a 3D model of a plane. CAD is also used in special effects to create 3D images and 3D environments. Many successful teams use CAD. There are numerous different CAD programs out there, ranging from expensive professional software to basic Tinkercad. Autodesk Inventor is a very feature-rich CAD program that contributes mostly to professionals in the manufacturing industry. It stores all files locally, meaning that file sharing and collaboration can be much more difficult, although this does also mean that you don't need an internet connection. It does, however, require a high-end computer to perform well and utilize all the features. Additionally, it has no support for macOS-based machines, meaning you would need to run it through emulation or boot camp. Autodesk Fusion 360 is essentially a cut-down version of Inventor. However, it still has a wide range of features for designing, rendering, and even simulated st uh, stress tests. It has a cloud-based file system for easy collaboration and allows you to model parts inside of assemblies, which makes modeling specific parts for those assemblies very easy. 
The only downside is that it too requires a fairly powerful computer to run well, although it does support macOS natively. Onshape is often referred to as the Google Docs of CAD because it runs completely over the cloud, alleviating the need for a powerful computer, yet retains a high level of functionality. It also allows for more than one member to be using a document at once, a feature that has been hugely useful for collaboration. Lastly, it also has a self-paced learning center, uh, making it very easy to bring new members up to speed. Although you can run Onshape on theoretically any device with a web browser, it does benefit hugely from faster internet speeds. SolidWorks is the most widely taught CAD software in colleges and the software of choice for manufacturing professionals due to its vast uh, selection of features. Though like its competitor, Inventor, you'll need a powerful computer to run it, and it lacks support for Mac computers. Creo is known for its uh, numerous complex part relationships, constraints, and simulation features available, which make it appealing to those who can benefit from it, but also make it daunting to learn due to its lack of uh, tutorials and documentation. Like Inventor and SolidWorks, it also lacks support for macOS except for through emulators or bootcamp. Lastly, Tinkercad is a good program for teaching young kids the basics of part design, but should not be used for designing robots due to its lack of support for multi-part assemblies, as well as the lack of many commonly needed tools for part modeling. So now we're going to give you a quick demonstration on CAD at work. So in this we're using Onshape, primarily for convenience. It's our software that we use on Team 5040. Um, and it's also where we store our part library. So that'll come in handy later. So we're going to jump right in and insert the parts that we'll need for the basic drivetrain structure. So we're going to use four GoBuilda channels, which will be under the structure folder, GoBuilda, channel, and then we'll just need two of those and two of these. And I know that these aren't exactly neat in how they're inserted now, but that doesn't matter very much at the moment. And then a cool trick that you can use if you can't find things is if you don't know where something is, but you've opened it recently, you can just go to your recently opened and it'll be right there. So I'm going to enter four of these little right side uh, like right angle adapters for one of the middle beams and four for the other. And that's all we'll need for that basic drivetrain structure. So we're going to use the most basic constraint in CAD for these. And this is just fasten. It basically says take these two points, they stay together. They will not move away from each other. It is just a flush mount. You don't need to CAD screws. That is time consuming and it will take up resources on your CAD program. So we're just going to add fasten mates to each of these. And you can see what I'm doing when they go into the wrong position is I'm just hitting this rotate axis until it goes where I want. Because you'll probably know that if two points are the only constraint, then you'll need to specify what angle exactly it needs to go at. So now that we're done inserting those on the inner channels, all that's left is to connect them to the outer channels. And this is what will give us that initial skeleton of the drivetrain. So again, we'll just take our fasten mate, take that point, and we'll connect it to, say, here. And a nice feature of Onshape, but a lot of other software uh, programs have it 
is that you can program like preview your mate before it actually applies using the solve button uh, and so I can see that I'm correct and just enter that and I'll repeat the process for these four mates although I suppose you do only need three and so now we've created our skeleton for the drivetrain itself Next, we'll want to insert our motors and our plates to mount it. So now that we've inserted this, I usually like to create little sub-assemblies inside this. You can actually create dedicated sub-assemblies outside of this document by just hitting the little plus and then creating assembly. Per se, in here you could create the entire motor assembly and then you could have a separate assembly even after that for just the wheel along with its adapter, its shaft, uh, bearings, everything. But we're just going to be using this. In bigger assemblies though, you might want to utilize that. For instance, our, our full robot uh, CAD documents, we do use uh, sub-assemblies quite extensively. And so I'm just going to constraint these motors onto their plates and so now you can see that we have all of our motors attached to these go build a quad blocks now you might be wondering what exactly are we planning to do with these you'll see in a minute so next I'm going to insert the wheels that we're going to be using. In this case we're going to go with GoBuilda's brand new thinner mechanism wheels. Alright, so now that we have everything that we'll need for this drivetrain, we're just I'm just gonna do some basic constraints, beginning with attaching the hubs to the wheels. Now you can see in these mechanism wheels they have a shallow end and a deep end, and we're going to put these hubs inside the deep end. Oh, not in the center spot though so that we can save some space. After creating all of my constraints, I actually realized that I had put these axles in backwards, so I'm just going to edit these constraints here, line it up with the hole I meant to put it in the first time. Now I'm going to flip it around, and let's see, does it line up? or do I have to offset it at an angle? It is not lined up, so I'll just change that to 30 degrees there, and there we go. Okay, so now that we have all of our constraints done on the wheels and hubs themselves, it's time to add bearings to our design. So, your first instinct might to be just to add them to the wheels themselves, but I always prefer to add them 
right onto the drivetrain. And so this is where our handy dandy Revolute mates are going to come in. So we're going to select that outer rim where you can see this offset here is going to hit against the metal to keep it from popping through the hole. And we're just going to slot it right into there, turn it around, and we now have a bearing in that spot. So we'll do that with our eight bearings. And now we have all eight of our bearings inserted. So with that Revolute Mate, uh, you might be worried that it's not totally constraining it. But if you just fix this drivetrain so that it won't move when you drag it, then you can see how it just spins around inside the hole. So next, we want to just take our, our wheels and we can constrain them directly. Now you may think we need another Revolute Mate. And we can use a Revolute Mate without issues. The only issue is that it would not follow alongside these bearings here. And so you just want to do a, uh, a fasten constraint. And so they'll move together as the single unit that they are. And with the bearings, you'll often run into the issue that it's very hard to find the exact degree uh, that you need in order to get them to line up. Uh, that's an issue that I typically ignore because, again, it's not a big deal at all. Um, although, if you really do want to give it the polished look, then you can either just go with a planer mate first on one of these faces and then give a planer mate also onto the bearing inside or you can uh, go trial and error with just changing the degree little by little. Typically though you want to just take bite the bullet and make that extra mate and so if I want to do that, I can just change this into a planar mate. And you can see now that it is constrained to it. However, it does have freedom in every other direction. So we will still need that revolute mate or sorry, fasten mate. And so now, as you can see, it perfectly lines up with that bearing there. And so we'll just do that for all the other wheels. So in order to make a bevel gear drivetrain. This is sort of modeled off of the Go Build a Strafer kit. You'll need a bunch of these little Go Build a bevel gears. And so these are handy because they serve not only as bevel gears, of course, but they also serve as shaft collars. And so we can just constrain one of these right onto the bearings. Reverse that. And you can see that it's actually clipped inside of the channel because that's too close. And so what we'll want to do now is just give it an offset again. You can see that the Z direction is the direction we need that offset. And so we'll just give it two millimeters. I usually like to try. Oh, we need to invert that though. Negative four. All right. And so we just need to remember to do that with each of our bevel gears. And now we're quickly approaching the end of this process. So the last part is that we'll just need to give the bevel gears to these motor modules 
and we'll need to secure them into the channel where the gears can mesh with these. Now, just temporarily, we're going to give these fasten mates an arbitrary off space, keeping in mind that we will likely have to change what offset we give it from the shaft later on. And now we have all of the motor modules that we'll need. And we'll just test out really quick what distance we need to mount these at. So we'll use that solve tool. And as we can see here, it is close enough to mesh. You can create gear uh, relations within on shape so that this spins when this spins uh, although this motor is secured using a group constraint so that would make the wheels captive not able to spin so a little trick I did earlier you might not have noticed is that I didn't secure this bearing to this axle and so that way we can this gear will not move along with this, but it'll still provide the effect of seeing what this is. Remember, the purpose of CAD is to be a blueprint. Your blueprint doesn't need to be absolutely flawless as long as you can tell what mechanism you're trying to build and you can effectively see how you need to put everything together. So here we have it, our completed drivetrain. Modeled off of the GoBuild a Strafer kit, it contains all the mates you'll need to see exactly how it's supposed to function from these gears being able to spin on their own with the exception of this of course and the drivetrain is all constrained so that you can use this as a sub-assembly for a future robot so hopefully you have some information now that can help you and your team improve your design and building process. Our contact information is up there in the top left corner if you'd like to reach out in the future. And thanks for sticking with us. Have a great rest of your day.